Adrian, and we're going to have a beautiful time, a beautiful service. Brother Nathan Clark is going to come and help with music, and uh, and Jeremy Damesworth is going to be preaching that service, and I think Brother Wilkerson and maybe Brother Brown will be here, and Brother Cagle will be here, and uh, it's just going to be a beautiful time, and we're going to have lots of fun, and uh, we're just going to enjoy uh, the church being debt free. The grass feels a little different out there. The yard feels like if we actually own it and it belongs to us and doesn't belong to the bank no more. Amen? I'm here thankful for that. Hallelujah. And then the following Sunday is our spring revival with Brother Kenny Chester. Uh, you're going to enjoy his ministry. He's from uh, Walnut, Mississippi, and uh, we're looking forward to having him in service with us on the 25th. And then Saturday, Saturday the 31st, we're having our Easter egg hunt here at the church on Saturday. Uh, we're going to have hot dogs and jumpers and popcorn and cotton candy, whatever it is. We're going to have lots of stuff and lots of fun here at 2 o'clock on Saturday the 31st. And then at 4 o'clock, the young people are having movie night here at the church, and they're going to have a great time, 4 o'clock on that day. And then uh, uh, April the 1st is Resurrection Sunday. How many are thankful that Jesus Christ rose from the grave? Amen, and we're looking forward to that. Amen, God bless you. Let's just worship with the praise team as they sing. circumstances that you have decided that God is greater than my obstacle, God is greater than my problem.
that your word says that you want to give good gifts to your children. God, we need some healing to take place in this building right now, Lord. Jesus, we pray for those in need of a touch in their body, God. I pray for those that are in need, the ones that are struggling with cancer, dear Lord, right now where Sister Bertha is, God. <laughs> Jesus, in your name, send angels into that house right now, Lord. Jimmy Crutchfield, God, is dealing with cancer right now. Send angels to him with healing, God, to touch his body, Lord. Sister Doris's mother in that hospital room, Lord God, send angels there right now to heal and to touch and move upon her body. Give strength and be a provider, God. Lord, there are individuals in this house that need financial help, dear Lord. Oh, I've never seen the righteous forsaken. I've never seen his seed begging bread. Right now, Lord, we put it all in your hands, God. We put it into your hands, Lord. Be a provider and a way maker right now, Lord. We stand at the door and knock, dear Lord. Open the door for him. We're seeking, Lord. Help us to find right now, God. Lord, we lay all of these needs in your hands, Lord, and we trust you and we depend Worship with the praise team as they sing.
giving them some great praise right now. Come on, it's a good time. Especially my Gowan family. Amen. I I love Mama, and and because I love Mama, I love all of you just like my brothers and sisters. And I thank God for you, and I thank God that you're here today. Uh, everybody here that is here, 
My, my wife, uh, because I put it on Facebook, she, she knows what I'm going to be teaching. And she said, she said, honey, she said, no, all of these wonderful visitors here, and you're going to be teaching on giving. And I said, absolutely. <laughs> yes. Because what I'm going to give you is not negative. It is the best thing you have ever heard in your life. If you can take this into your spirit and apply this, this will deliver you. And the church got very quiet because he's, we're all backslid. <laughs> no, it's we need help in this generation. And I, I honor my brother. I, I thank you for your very kind words. Thank you so much. And, and I don't take what he said uh, lightly at all. I, uh, I appreciate the, the fact that he honors me. He, he called me the bishop of this church. That's, that's a pretty tall guy right there. And uh, I, I do appreciate uh, him al allowing me to be sensitive to the Holy Ghost and, and to deliver what I feel like is important for the church. Uh, don't, I, I'm, if you're wondering what I'm doing, I'm waiting for all of my young people to get back in here, all the band. The band is mostly backslid, so they really need to hear this. And all the vocals, all those vocalists, they really are backslid, so I want them to. I want you to relax, okay? R relax. Don't, you, you don't need to draw up. If, if You need to be able to open your heart and receive this word right now. I'm going to plant precious, precious, powerful seed in this church. And it's something that I have felt for a while now for this congregation. We don't, we, we don't talk about money for crying out loud. We barely even mentioned that we're receiving an offer. Now all ushers come and they just appear out of the woodwork and, 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 and take the, the offering. And, and, and I love all that. So, but we're not focused on money as far as the church. We're, we're, God has blessed us so much. We're, we're celebrating a note burning this next week. Isn't that awesome? Amen. Hasn't God been good to us? So I'm, I'm not here to raise an offering. I'm not here to, to uh, say, oh, we're not giving. No, this is a great, amazing giving church. This is this, this not the issue at all. It's not about the church. This is about you. Now do me a favor. Look at your beautiful neighbor beside you on either side of you. If you have somebody on either side and say, this is all about you. It's your fault. It's about you. How many love Brother Ball back there? Uh, Brother Ball, he, he ministered. I give honor to Brother Ball, Brother, Brother Walters, all the ministers here in this, Brother uh, Vincent, ever, all of you ministers, all of you wonderful men of God, you're capable of teaching this, but God didn't put that on you to do. He put it on me to do, and so I'm going to teach it. And if I get excited, I may stand up, but I, I got the stool here to remind me that I'm supposed to be teaching. How about that? <laughs> 2 Corinthians chapter 9. It's always good to base your Bible study on the Bible, right? <laughs> so that's a good place to start. 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Chris, I want you to, to if you can, follow along with Dad as much as you, you possibly can. I want these to be on the screen and, and really, if you've got a pen or paper, it would, or, or write it in your Bible, mark it in your Bible. I'm going to give you things that you're really, really going to want to know this. It, it's, this is vitally important. What I'm about to share with you is not something I learned yesterday or a week ago or a month ago or last night. Or This is something that I have had in practice in my life for years and years and years and years. This is a proven principle. Everything that I'm going to teach you is proven. 
and I've not proven it by hearing somebody else tell me about it. I've proven it by living it and operating it and seeing God bless it. I've seen it. And I'll give you some, some personal uh, uh, testimonies in, in a little while. And in the middle of this, this is going to be unlike any Sunday. Uh, Gallons, you showed up at a great Sunday because this is your, your time to speak up. Anybody can ask a question. Voice a dissent. If you're there, <laughs> you're able to, I want you, if you don't understand, say, Brother Tim, I don't understand that, or can you explain that? Or at the end of it, I'm going to give you, if y'all will remind me, okay, because I don't want to get beside myself and forget, I want to give you an opportunity to ask questions, if you have a question, or make a comment, or tell a testimony, all right? This is something I want for this church because I'm, I, and I'm going to explain why. All right? Uh, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6, and everybody said, Amen. Amen. Put it up there, swing. But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly. And he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Every man, according as he has purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly, or of necessity. For the Lord, for God loveth a cheerful giver. For God loveth a cheerful giver. And God is able, I love this next verse, and God is able to make all grace abound toward you that ye having all sufficiency in all things may abound to every good work. Let me put a great advertisement in for the goodness of God. He no, no, did go back. Verse 8. <clears throat> that ye always having all sufficiency in all things, it is God's will for you to have enough. That's right. Yes. Come on. It is God's will for you to have enough. Your definition and my definition. And God's definition of enough sometimes differs. But when it comes to a differing of opinion with God, God wins. Because God is never wrong. And if God says, I'll have enough, that settles the question. It is just then simply a matter of do I trust God or not? that ye may abound to every good work when he says I want you to have enough he is saying I want you to have everything that you need to accomplish the calling and the mission that I have placed upon your life as a believer in the earth. Amen. You're not here just to exist. You are here to thrive in the kingdom of God. Praise God. So, at the end of this, I don't know how it's all going to wash out, but at the end of this, we may end up in the altar on our face in repentance. And can I say something about the altar right now? You might want to write this down because this is $10 million worth of solid gold word right here. In, in the church today, we have turned our altars into a place of apology more than a place of death. Come on, 
The altar is not where I go simply to apologize. The altar is where I go to die out to myself. And what I am going to preach to you today requires for us in our flesh sometimes to crucify our flesh and die out to me and live in Christ Jesus. So if the, the Lord calls you to an altar, don't come down here just to simply say, God, I'm sorry. Come down here in your time of repentance to say, Lord, I died to myself. I'm going to rise to newness. I'm going to do better. Yes. Yes. Amen. Amen. Tell your neighbor, say, we all have to do better. Now, here's some things I read last night. This speaks to the crux of why this message is so important for the church. This, what I read last night, comes from a publication, Stress in America, Paying with Our Health. It's a survey released by the American Psychological Found, uh, Association in uh, 2015. Okay? I'm just going to read you some, some facts. Okay? Just read them off. Okay? Some facts. The survey, which was conducted by Harris Poll, on behalf of the APA among 3,068 adults in August 2015, found that 72, listen, 72% of Americans reported feeling stressed about money at least some time of the month during the past month. Let that sink in. 72% of Americans have felt stress about money sometime in the last month. Money. 22% said that they experienced extreme stress about money during the past month. 22% said they experienced extreme stress on a scale. By extreme stress is defined on a scale of 1 to 10. They ranked it 8, 9, or 10. That's a great deal of stress. Listen to this. For the majority of Americans, 64% of Americans, money is somewhat or very significant or a very significant source of stress, but especially for parents of younger adults, 77% of them, 75% of millennials, that's the 1835 crowd. And 76% of the Xers. That's the 36 to 49ers. A significant source of stress. Here's one. Nearly one in five Americans say that they have either considered skipping. That's 9%. Or skipped. That's 12%. Going to the doctor when they needed health care because of financial resources. One in five. One in five people do not go see a doctor because they don't have the money. And they are worried about their finances. Stress about money also impacts relationships. Almost a third of adults with partners, 31%, report that money is a major source of conflict in their relationship. In an analysis of data, survey respondents discovered that 23% of 
of the respondents were experiencing symptoms commonly associated with PTSD related to their finances. Let that sink in. 23% of Americans suffer some form of symptoms associated with PTSD because of money problems. But then the church is supposed to kind of remain silent on this issue. Doesn't make sense, does it? Because these surveys were not surveys of the unchurched only. These surveys included folks in the church. These, this survey included folks just like you and me. And so I know that ministering as a pastor for all the years that I pastored and in, in, in all these years of ministry, in counseling folks, these numbers are typical for what I have personally experienced in counseling with people over the years. And financial problems. And, and you say, well, when you come to Jesus, that everything's going to be made okay. And when you come to the Lord and you get, you get this great brand new relationship, that, then you, you shouldn't have all these words. Guess what? Just because you came to God does not free you from all the, the, the stresses and the problems of life itself. Right. Right. So I want to help us because we cannot be effective as God wants us to be as believers in this world if 23% if of us, if 5% of us are suffering PTSD because of our finances. And some of us are suffering PTSD because of finances and I know it. The Bible has a remedy for this problem. Somebody say amen. amen. The Bible offers 500 verses about on prayer, fewer than 500 verses on faith, hold on to your seats, and more than 2,000 verses on money. Y'all are drawing up on me. Oh my God. This is going to turn. Around 500 on prayer, fewer than 500 on faith, and more than 2,000 on money. I would say that it's an important topic. And I say that it's an important topic for us to talk about here today. Jesus taught a lot on the topic of money. 15% of everything Jesus ever taught was on the top of, topic of money and possessions. More than his teaching on heaven and hell combined. Think about that. Don't you know, this is why Satan is attacking the people of God through this avenue of money. And Jesus dealt with this. And the Word of God deals with this because he wants you to have freedom from financial stress. Turn to somebody and tell them, say, I want you to be free from financial stress. So why does God care about money so much? I believe that there is a foundational connection between our spiritual lives and how we deal with money and think about money. I believe it goes hand in hand. God knows that 
You and I need money. Can we agree with that? You think God knows we need it? God knows that we need it. And God knows that we think about it a lot. And God knows that we think about money a lot. God knows that he can try me and test me based upon how I respond to having money and not having money. It is a good barometer for yourself and a good barometer for God. Think about in your life how you face financial problems and how that affects your relationship with God and that will say a whole lot about where you are in your ability to trust and depend upon God rather than yourself. And the church said amen. amen. And the church said amen again. Amen. So here are five verses. I'm going to start you out really simple here. Five verses. Everybody needs to know about money. Okay? You need to write these down. These five, you're going to need to know these. I'm not going to expound on them very much. I'm just going to drop them right here. Go back. Memorize these. You need to know. The first thing you need to know about money, finances, and God's provision, Philippians 4, chapter 19. Philippians chapter 4, verse 19. But my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Say it with me. But my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. The most important thing you need to know about your money is your money is not the most important thing and the most important factor in your supply. The most important factor in your supply is your God. And the Bible says my God shall supply all of your needs according to his riches to know that first and if you can't grasp that everything else I say will mean nothing to you remember that the next thing you need to know Malachi 3.10 Malachi 3.10 this is important bring ye all the tithe into the storehouse that there may be meat in my house, and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. There is a way to open the windows of heaven of blessing in your life. Remember that verse. We're going to talk about that in detail. 1 Timothy 16. You need 16, 16. You need to know this. You need to know this one. For the love of money is the root of all evil. Which, while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Money is not evil. The love of money is evil. You need to know this about money. Money is not evil. The love of money is yes. evil. Right. Acts chapter 20, verse 35. You need to know this. I have showed you all things, how that so laboring you ought to support the weak. And to remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said, say it with me, it is more blessed to give 
than to receive. You gotta know that about money. It's more blessed to give than to receive. All right. I'm giving you some good. I could finish these five verses, close this down, and you go home and just act on what I have told you, and your life would instantly improve if you're not already actively, powerfully, intentionally involved in operating these things. Vastly improve. I promise you. I promise you. I guarantee you by the word of God. Your life will improve. By operating this right alone. Proverbs chapter 22 verse 7. Nobody likes this one. Because in our society we love to borrow. But you need to know this about money. The rich ruleth over the poor, and the borrower is servant to the lender. You feeling stressed? It may be because you are a slave. Come on. That's good. Yes. Come on. That's right. Now, I'm not going to ask who here besides me, I'll admit, but I'm not going to ask who here besides me owes somebody some money. I didn't ask you to. You don't have to. But when we think about owing credit card companies, student loans, Automobile notes, mortgages. Let me go to the to the to the really evil ones. Title loan associations. If you think you're a slave to all the others, take your car title to one of them. See what's going to happen. You'll think you're in hell. <laughs> <laughs> you, young people, you listen to me. Pay close attention to me. I'm giving you things right now that can set you on the path to financial freedom and freedom from all the stress in your life that will improve your future marriages and relationships and relationship with God and standing in the kingdom of God. Hold these things tight. I'm saying these things because I love this church. I love you people. I love you. And I want you to be happy. I want you to prosper in your life. So let's look at God's plan for our money. We're going to answer a few questions here today. You ready? What is a tithe? We'll answer it. What's an offering? We'll answer it. Who should tithe? We'll answer it. Does the New Testament require tithing? We'll answer it. Is it possible for my finances to be cursed? We'll answer it. Does money have any relationship to my salvation? We'll answer it. Does God use money to test me? We'll answer it. And I'm going to give you solid Bible for everything I have to say. So Malachi 3. Go there, Sister Kristen. Verse number 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12. Malachi, Malachi chapter 3. We're going to dig right into it. Will a man rob God? That is a question for you. Will a man rob God? But God said, yet ye have robbed me. He's talking to his people, Israel. 
But you say, wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and offerings. Not just the tithe. And offerings. Look at verse 9. Ye are cursed with a curse. For ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. Not a few of you here, body did it. Bring ye all the tithes. This is one of our key verses. You remember this. Bring ye all the tithe into the storehouse that there may be meat in mine house and prove me. Now, herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. I love this verse. And I will. Thank you, Jesus. I will rebuke the devourer for your sake. You can't do that for yourself. You can't stop the devourer. You can't control the devourer. But he said, I will rebuke the devourer for your sake. And he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground. Neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, saith the Lord of hosts. Promise. So what is a tithe? What is a tithe? When it says, bring ye all the tithe. When it says, ye, ye have robbed me. And they said, where with have we robbed you? He said, in tithe and offering. I think I want to know what a tithe is. So I'm going to pretend that nobody here knows what a tithe is. I'm going to just pretend that some of you do know, some of you may have an idea, and some of you may have no clue. So, so for everybody, I'm going to tell you that a tithe is a tenth part. Tithe is a tenth part. In Leviticus chapter 27 and verse 30, Chris, I'll wait on you to get it. In 30, 31, and 32, Leviticus chapter 27. And all the tithe of the land, listen to this, and all of the tithe, all the tithe of land, everything, wherewith the seed of the land or the fruit of the tree is the Lord's. Notice that. The tithe is not the people's. The tithe is the Lord's. It is holy unto the Lord. It's in your pocket, in your storehouse. It's in your care, but it belongs to the Lord. And the Bible says it is holy unto the Lord. When you start talking about holy things in the Word of God, holy things mishandled gets you killed. I'm just being transparent. <clears throat> Messing with holy things, mishandling holy things, brings death and destruction. When the Philistines, for instance, the, the Ark of the Covenant was a holy thing. And the Philistines steal the Ark one time. And they take the Ark of the Covenant and they skip out of Israel. Look, 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 look what we got. Look what we got. And they say, this magic box. That's what they thought it was. It's a magic box. Because they had watched the children of Israel carry that ark into battle. And when the ark was present, that holy presence of God, that ark was present in battle. The children of Israel were undefeated. They could not be beaten. And so the Philistines say, get us that ark and we will be invincible. So they get this holy ark, this holy thing, and they take that ark from the holy place of God and they take it out of Israel and they capture it and they take it to their pagan temples and they set it up in there thinking, we're really good, man, we got it made now. We are invincible. But what they did not know is you cannot take a holy thing and miss a holy thing for an unholy purpose. And when they set it up in the temple, 
people. God said, watch this. And they go to bed that night. And when they go to bed that night in their temple, all of their statues, all of their gods, all their things that they thought were so important and so powerful, in the middle of the night, that holy thing shook and rumbled that temple, that pagan temple, until their their idols fell down off their pedestals and broke in the smithereens and they woke in the next morning and God had destroyed their idols with his holy magic box because a holy thing cannot be misused for an unholy purpose. And then to their dismay, 50,000 of them woke up with hemorrhoids. Right, right. Hemorrhoids. That's what it said. And no preparation H. Because that's the kind of stuff that happens when you take a holy thing and use it for an unholy purpose. And you got a holy thing in your back pocket or your pocketbook. And the whole church said, uh oh. <laughs> Where am I? Somebody remind me. Verse 30. 31. 30, 31. And if a man will at all redeem aught of his tithe, he shall add thereto the fifth part thereof. No worries. If you mess up with your tithes, actually according to this, I'm not going to say this applies to you because this is all in the law. Let me give you that. But under the law, if you messed up with your tithes, you not only you didn't owe ten, you owe fifteen. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Y'all really ain't receiving that. Y'all like <laughs> <laughs> thirty-two. And concerning the tithe of the herd or of the flock, even whatsoever, even whatsoever passeth under the rod, the tenth shall be holy unto the Lord. They, they, when they were tithed in their flock. They would hold a rod out, their sheep, their lamb, their oxen, all the. When they would prosper, the, all these new uh, lambs had been born. They would hold the rod out and they would pass that, that lamb under the rod. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. The, the, down tenth, and that's the Lord's. That's not mine, that's the Lord's. That becomes a holy lamb. A holy oxen. A holy. Are y'all still with me? That's the Lord's. Right. Touch your neighbor close to you and say, God has his own. So, the question is for all of us gathered here, living in the dispensation of grace, the, 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 the law is far past. Jesus Christ came. He fulfilled the law. He broke the, the, the law of uh, the curse of sin and death upon us and and the ordinances that were written. I mean, he, he shattered it, and we are no longer under the law. We are under grace. And it's amazing. So, the question is, does the New Testament require tithing? That's a good question. That's a good question. So, I, I want to teach you about it. First of all, it's erroneous. To say that tithing is law. It is not just the law. Because the law was not given until Moses. Tithing preceded the law. Tithing came before Moses. Before there was an ordinance. So 
Some people argue, well, we're in the dispensation of grace, and the tithing has passed away because we don't have a law. I'm going to tell you, I'm not going to apologize for it. The, the tithing is not a New Testament ordinance at all, whatsoever, and we find nothing as far as ordinance in the New Testament that binds you to tithing. Nothing that binds you. There's no scripture in verse that says, in the New Testament, after Calvary, you must tithe. It's not there. Not there. So I guess that means I really don't have to. Well, hold on. Hold on. Because, because I have integrity. Okay, folks? I have. This man of God has integrity with the Word of God, and I'm not going to tell you something that's there that is not there. But I'm also going to tell you that just because you don't have Scripture in verse binding you to tithing, that it's a good idea not to tithe. Amen. Amen. The apostle Paul wrote about tithing in a very striking similarity of when Abraham tithed to Melchizedek and the Lord Jesus Christ. So the ordinance is not there, but the principle is taught. For Hebrews chapter 7, verse 1, get me there, Chris, please, thank you. Hebrews 7 and 1, we're going to go down through uh, uh, verse 3. Watch this. Hebrews 7 and 1. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, verse 2, to whom also Abraham, watch, Abraham before the law, gave a tenth part of all, first being by interpretation king of righteousness, after that also king of Salem, which is king of peace. Now, now listen to that. He's king of righteousness, peace. Did you, did you catch it? Sounds a lot like somebody else we know. Right? Look at verse 3. Without father, who does it sound like? Without mother, without descendant, or descent, having neither beginning of days, nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abideth a priest continually. How does that sound like to you? Doesn't that sound like Melchizedek is the same thing as Jesus Christ? Very similar. Doesn't have a beginning or ending of days. He's the king of peace. The king of righteousness. And Abraham tithed to him. Now think about that. Abraham was known as the friend of God. Somebody say friend of God. Amen. Because of his faith. And because of his faith, he paid tithe unto one who was like unto the Son of God. Read it right there. But made like unto the Son of God. One of the reasons why Abraham was a friend of God because he paid tithes unto one who was like unto the Son of God. Now you can say, I don't have a scriptural mandate in the New Testament to tithe. I say, I don't have a scriptural mandate not to tithe. As a matter of fact, I have got reason enough right there to say I want to be a friend of God. Therefore, I am going to tithe. Every true Christian is made partaker 
of Abraham's covenant. That's why we are who we are. Because of Father Abraham. Abraham walked with God and he received the blessing from God as he paid God tithe unto God's representative. He was blessed. How many know Abraham was blessed? Even under the dispensation of grace, the man who seeks God's richest blessings will find that blessing as he walks before God in tithing. If you want to be right with God. Jacob, a long time before the law was given, vowed a vow to God. Genesis chapter 28, verse 22. 28 and 22 in Genesis. And this stone, which I have set as a pillar, shall be, shall be God's house. And of all that thou give me, I will surely give the tenth unto thee. Think about that. Y'all know the story, right? Jacob lays his head down on the pillow, uh, the rock, and uses it as the pillow when he gets his dream from God. There's, there's a ladder that reaches to heaven, and the angels are going up and down, and then God, God comes to him and talks to him and, and pronounces this profuse blessing of how he's going to be blessed and all the things that he's going to do. And Jacob wakes up from that dream right here in verse 22, and he wakes up from that and he goes, Whoa! What was that? And he says, God, this is, from now on, this place is going to be called your house. And to seal this vow, everything that you promised me, when you put it in my life, I'm giving you the tenth part of everything. I don't know about you, but old Tim is going to give God the tenth part of everything God blesses me with. And I will not fail to do it. Amen, somebody. It's going to help you. And that was before the law. I wonder where Jacob learned that. Wonder where Jacob learned that. You reckon he crawled up on his granddaddy's knee one day and his granddaddy said, Hey son, let me give you a secret to why I'm blessed. Let me tell you just how this works. And here's Abraham, possibly the richest man that ever lived. And the reason I know this is because God promised him that his seed would be as the sands of the sea and the stars of the sky. And he said, in thee, all nations of the earth shall be blessed. And he gave him a promise that said, the land that thy foot treadeth upon, that will I give unto thee. Brother Bruce, everywhere he walked became his own real estate. Wouldn't Donald Trump love to have that kind of a... Oh my God. Donald Trump, he'd walk across America, wouldn't he? He'd just, he'd just take that walk. Think about it. But if Donald Trump was Abraham and he was living under the Abraham covenant and he had that promise from God everywhere he walked, everything, God would give him the land. That's why Abraham was so blessed. No wonder... He probably pulled young Jacob up on his lap and said, Hey, son, let me talk to you about something. I learned early on in my conquest that if I would give God the tenth part of his blessings to me, that he would bless me greater. And so when Jacob gets up from that dream, he said, Woo, I've got a promise like my grandfather. Think about it. God had just told him in a dream, I'm going to bless you. I'm going, I'm going to give you favor with men. I'm going to give you that tenth part, God. I'm, I'm going to do the same thing my grandfather did. And somebody said, hey, Amen. Amen. Let's talk about how God supplies. This is an important part. Everybody, listen to me. No believer. No believer ever 
should feel too poor to pay tithes. I don't have enough is the biggest lie that Satan ever told you. I can't afford to tithe is the biggest lie Satan ever told anybody, anywhere, at any time. Amen. That's true. Because it goes against our faith. That's why I said the altar doesn't need to be just a place of apology. We need to turn that altar back into a place of death and we die to our flesh. Because our flesh will argue with us, you can't do it. You cannot afford it. I've seen many people struggle with this truth. All their lives, they feel like I can't. I can't participate. Now think about how cruel God would be if he set out a plan. Sister Patty, if God set out a plan, think about how cruel it would be. If he set out a plan and then he made you or me or anybody else so poor, we could never hope to participate in his plan. Think about that. Think about the, 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 the cruelty of a God that would do something like that, that would make a perfect plan for blessing, but to say, you know what? I'm not going to give you enough to participate. Why? Malachi 3.10 Let's go back to it Bring ye all the tithe Into the storehouse That there may be meat in my house And prove me now wherewith Herewith saith the Lord of hosts If I will not open you the windows Listen, listen, listen If I will not open you the windows of heaven And pour you out a blessing That there shall not be room enough To receive it That's that's a, that's a promise associated with that command. That's a promise. Proverbs chapter 3. Kristen, go there. Verse 9 and 10. Now I want you to get this. Listen to this. I'm going to speak to this lying devil, the spirit of poverty. And there is a spirit of poverty that is trying to invade the, the, the ranks of believers. And that's causing stress, financial stress. And you don't realize where it's coming from, but it is a spirit of poverty. And I'm going to preach to that spirit right now. Honor, listen to me. This is the word of God. Honor the Lord with thy substance and with the first fruits of all thine increase. If I say tithe, tithe. honor the Lord with it. Honor the Lord with it. Remember, you hold something holy. Honor the Lord with it. Verse 10. Watch this. So shall thy barns be filled with plenty and thy presses shall burst out with new wine. God says, I am the Lord of the harvest. I am the Lord of the harvest. I determine whether, whether a stalk of corn produces one ear, such a gallon, you're in the farm business that you were all your life, one ear or four ears. I determine whether that one ear has a lot of kernels and rich and full or if it's sickly. I am the Lord of the harvest. You can't control that. You can't fix it. I don't care what kind of fertilizer you put on it, how you water it, how you care for it. If God does not bless it and bring it forth into fruition, it will not be blessed. You say, well, I'm not a farmer. I don't know how this... Let me tell you something. God is the one who determines whether you get the raise or not. Whether you get the bonus or not. You say, well, that's my boss. No, your boss is not in control. God is in control. 
God is the one who determines whether you get the promotion or not. God is the one who determines whether he lays it on somebody's heart to bless you financially or not. God is the one who determines your tires on your car are going to last another 10,000 miles or they're going to pop tomorrow. Are y'all still hearing me? This becomes a matter of trusting God. I'm trying to deliver. I'm trying to deliver some folks right here. I promise this is something I have put in practice in my life. And look at me. I look like a million bucks. I asked Anita before I left. I said, Anita, do I look like somebody could talk to you about your money? We have fun. I promise you. The, the, the fact of the matter is it doesn't matter if I was here in overalls and, and, right. and, and, and britches with holes in them right. and, and, and I didn't have two pennies to rub together. I'd still be operating this plan and I would still have enough. Are y'all still with me? Y'all want me to quit or y'all want me to give a little more deliverance here? Come on, you want more? All right. The Lord loves to have his children take their stand upon his word and prove him. He will fulfill his word every time. So the question is, can my money be cursed? Malachi 3.9. Put it up there, Chris. And this y'all gonna love this verse. Y'all gonna love it. Can my money be cursed? <laughs> Ye are cursed with a curse. Everybody say glory. glory. Feels so good, doesn't it? Not. How does that feel good? For ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. Wait a minute, what you've got in your pocketbook, what you've got in your bank account, what you've got in your purse is holy. And if you don't honor God with what is holy, here's what happens. You're going to love this. We're going to Haggai. Can you find that on a computer? Haggai, chapter 1, verse 2, 4, 3, 4, 5, and 6. Hey, God, chapter 1. Here's what happened when God gets ready to curse your finances. Now, everybody, I want you to, to, to we're going to need to do breathing exercise. Ready? When I say three, inhale, real deep. One, two, three. Hold it. Exhale. One more time. One, two, three. Exhale. Because here it comes. Hey, God, chapter 1, verse 2. Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, This people say, The time does not come, the Lord, the time that the Lord's house should be built. They then came the word of the Lord by Haggai, saying, the prophet saying, Is it it is, is it time for you to dwell in your sealed houses and this house lie in waste waste? In other words, is it time for you to take care of all your own stuff but the house of God be neglected? Is that what time it is? Look at verse 5. Now therefore, God gets wroth, he gets angry. Now therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Think about what you've done. 6. Ye have so much and bring in little. Ye eat, but ye have not enough. Ye drink, but you're not filled with drink. Ye clothe ye, but there is none more. And he that earneth wages, earneth wages to put it into a bag with holes. When God gets ready to curse your finances, he knows what to do. Because you can't control everything around you. But the Bruce K. 
can't necessarily control when the termites going to eat the foundation out from under your house. How many times you've been to somebody's house and they didn't know there was a problem at all and the termites been munching like McDonald's french fries. I don't care how much money you made last week. Get that bill. I feel like you got a hole in your pocket. I had, a, I had a beautiful Jeep Wrangler. Loved that thing. Loved it, loved it, loved it, loved it, loved it. I had those big 17-inch tires on it. Had new tires, beautiful tires, beautiful, beautiful. I was going down the interstate, hit a piece of metal, sliced into the sidewall of that tire. I'm on the side of the road, changing the tire. That tire was 150 bucks. I have no control over that. You don't. So it's a time like that when you feel like you got a hole in your pocket. It's a time like that when you need a God to be the supplier of all your needs. You see, what I'm teaching you and, and, and delivering to you right now, young people, listen to this. I cannot exempt you from life. I can't exempt you from the problems of life. I can't exempt you from bad things happening because bad things happen to good people all the time. I, I can't I can't isolate you or insulate you from from never having a, a, a roof leak or I, I can't insulate you. All I can tell you is that all those things are going to happen one way or another. What you want in your life is you want the blessings of God flowing in your life so that there is supply to take care of life. So that God can choose to bless me any way he wants to. Y'all remember what I said about this church and, 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 and when we were replacing the roof. Remember what I said? I said, it's God's church. Remember what I said? I said, if he wants water in his church, he's going to put water in his church. Remember what I said? But because this church is a church of integrity and because we handle our finances with integrity and because God loves us and God helps us and because God knows we're doing the very best we can and because we were trying to do what we could to protect his house because of all of those factors, God used that, filled our house. Our building with water running down the vents, running running down the, the, the stairways, running. I mean, it was everywhere, dripping from the ceilings, every, water everywhere. Oh, yeah. and God chose to fill our house. And somebody that's skeptical might have said, where's all that tithing? Where's all that goodness? Where's all that? Where was God when all that was happening? Why did he protect you? Well, let me tell you how God works. God let us file an insurance claim. God allowed us to prosper and completely renovate and remodel the entire facility back there. Do work on this part of the facility. Have money left over in the bank when we got finished. And that was not supposed to happen. But when God gives you favor, that's what I'm talking about. God is able to give you favor where you shouldn't have favor. And God is able to turn your reversals and your obstacles into stepping stones for great blessings. And so I wasn't stressed when the water was running down the halls because I knew in whom I serve. I knew that he was going to supply all of our needs according to his riches in glory. And now we are paying off our mortgage and we have paid off our mortgage and we'll celebrate it next week. Glory be to God in the highest. Glory be to God in the highest because he's faithful. Not because
because we're rich, not because we're good, not because we're wealthy. It's because he's faithful. Yes, he is. God honors the trust that's placed in him. I gotta hurry. Jesus commended that poor widow. Remember that poor widow that came to tithe and all she had was two mites and she 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 threw that two mites in and the scripture says it was all that she had. And her two little mites that didn't even equal the value of one penny, those two mites that she threw in there. Jesus testified of her and he said she has given more than all of them. Don't ever tell me you're too poor to tithe. Don't ever tell me you're too poor to give. You're too poor not to. Stop that mentality. Stop it now. Stop Thinking that way, that is Satan's trick to keep you trapped in poverty. She gave all that she had. <coughs> the difference is, if, 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 if between the, the curse and the blessing, Malachi says, and I will rebuke the devourer for your, your sake and, shall, and he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground, neither shall your vine cast forth her fruit before the time in the field. And all the nations shall call you blessed, and ye shall be a delightsome land, saith the Lord. That's the difference. What about my debts? I'm, I'm, I'm tearing the devil up. He hates this message. He hates it. What about my debts? Well, what about them? Some want to question my words. Do I pay my bills or do, do I tithe or do I give? Well, let me ask you. I'm, this is, I'm not being sarcastic. I'm asking you an honest question. You should ask yourself. Do you want to owe God or do you want to owe somebody else? Is it better to owe God or better to owe somebody else? The curse is pronounced on those that withhold their tithe. And the, the thing that the devil knows, he knows that if he can keep you from giving, from releasing the seed that's in your hand, that, that is seed, he knows if he can keep you from releasing it by fear, that he can cut off your ability to be blessed. I say, give and trust God. Tell your neighbor close to you, say, trust God. Trust him. The most unbelieved beatitude in the Bible. It's the most unbelieved one. Acts chapter 20, verse 35. I've showed you all things, how that so laboring you ought to support the weak and to remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said it is more blessed to give than to receive. That is the most unbelieved beatitude in the Bible. It's more blessed to give. So, personal testimonies. And I'm going to have for some questions and then we're going to go home. And I know we've been doing this a long time. You need this. You need this. Personal testimonies. I've activated it in my life. There have been times when I didn't have two pennies to rub together. There have been times when I did not know where the money is going to come for the next bill. There have been times. When we were young, this is just for anybody that does not know this. When we were young, we, uh, our first baby, uh, we lost him. Jonathan Ray was born. He lived two days. Anita was, was in intensive care baby when he was born went straight into intensive care he lived two days and he did not make it we were in the med in Memphis and the medical bills were astronomical at that time I was working a minimum wage job at, at, at that time the minimum wage was listen three dollars and twenty five cents an hour 
and the bills are coming in, and it's like, but Anita and I went to a singing. I got paid on a Friday night, and we went to a singing. It was a benefit. Remember when they used to do benefit gospel singing? Somebody had a need, and they would all get together, and everybody would sing, and then they'd give a love offering. We got there to the to the singing, and I had my paycheck in the bank. I cashed it, you know, $125. I owed this astronomical bill. I could, I could $125. My mind couldn't even comprehend how. And while they were singing, God spoke to me. This pastor had had a heart attack. Didn't have medic. He didn't have money for his medical bills. And here I've got a medical bill I can't pay. I couldn't even imagine to pay. Sister Amen, there's no way. And here's he's got a medical bill because he had a heart attack. And while they're singing, God spoke to me. And he said, get $100. Ricky, I'd like to pass that on. I thought, oh, God. Because the, the, the fact of the matter is I needed to put gas in my car. I needed to give Anita. She doesn't eat much, but she does eat something. I needed to feed my wife. I need... That's all we had. Nina's really had to put up with stuff living with me. Because I got this like this radical faith sometimes that'll take your breath away because I believe God. And I said, Anita, I'm gonna give him a hundred dollars. I'm sure she didn't say no, she she never has, never. Thank God for my brain. I'm sure her brain was standing. Are you crazy? <laughs> Took that offer. Gave it to that woman. With a bill I couldn't pay. Within two weeks. Two weeks. My medical bill was completely 100% erased. If I remember right, Anita, we had been paying the women's clinic. And we even got more back from the women's clinic than I gave in that offering. I'm telling you, that's one story. And I could sit here from now until midnight tonight and tell you time after time after time to make it more current. In 2012, when I resigned this church, This church had been so good to me and still is. Supported me financially and my family in a magnificent, marvelous, mind-blowing way. But when I resigned, that salary needed to go away, of course. And it left me and I with bills and things and Mounting medical costs because of my health. The reason I resigned to begin with. And I didn't know how, how am I going to, how are we going to. Sister Amy Bragg is here. She can testify this to be the truth. We never missed not one week giving our tithe, our offering. I never stopped. I never thought about stopping. I never contemplated cutting back. I never said one time, I can't afford it. 
Because, Sister Ball, I have this deep conviction of what I'm teaching you right now. I can't afford not to. I'm going to tell you right now that my, my, our income was slashed, slashed, less than half. But listen to me. Listen to me. We never missed one payment. Never made a late payment. Never, n never missed a meal. Did we make adjustments? Of course we did. We made the frugal adjustments. But my, my Bible tells me that he shall supply all of my needs according to his riches and glory. And he supplied every single solitary need, every single one of them. We did not do without never one single solitary time. So what I bring to you, I am not bringing to you as something like, oh, I'm trying to raise an offering for this church, or oh, I'm trying to, to, to bolster the income. I'm trying to deliver you, and I'm trying to tell you that if you are under financial stress, that is not the plan of God for your life. Get out from under it by giving. Pastor can do whatever he wants to with this. Uh, but uh, for my intention, there's no, I'm not intending to take an offering or anything else at the end of this. I, I want to leave you with the information and I want to leave you with this conviction in your heart that you need to search your heart. And if you are not doing this consistently, and, and let me tell you something, you can't expect... This, this is long, called long-term faith. It, this is something that has to operate over long-term. You can't say, well, I'm going to do this for two weeks and see how this works. No, that doesn't work that way. You start participating in this consistently. Operate it. Do it. Giving is the nature of God. And when you participate in the nature of God, you're going to get the blessings flowing. God is a giver by nature. The last thing I'm going to say Psalms chapter 116, verse 12. I know we've been, been long. Thank you. Thank you for staying with me. Thank you. Psalms 116, verse 12. Here's the question. Here's the question. Come in. Psalms 116, verse 12. What shall I render unto the Lord? for all his benefits toward me? That's the question. That's what the psalmist David asked. He said, what, what should I give God in light of everything he's given me? And that's the question you've got to ask yourself every day. It's not just about finances. It's about your talent, your time. Remember, how you respond with your finances Having finances and having without is a good indicator of what your relationship with God is like. Okay, I promised that I would open it for questions if anybody has any questions. I may have covered it so perfectly well nobody, nobody has a question. Or you may be so completely worn out until you think, please God, do not let anybody ask him a question. He is a water-powered windmill. Do not. Tithing and, and, and giving are indeed linked to your salvation, not because of the command necessarily. <laughs> no, it, it's not linked to your salvation as, as a direct link. As a, you know, if I don't give a dollar, I'm going straight to hell. It's not linked in that way, but that's one of the lies of the adversary. He wants you to, he wants everything to just be cut and dry, black and white, scripture and verse and everything. You know, you got to do this. And, 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 and if, I can, if I can just have a list of things that I, I'm supposed to do and I click off those lists and I'm going to heaven. No, it's not that. It's not that simple. It's, it's a question of where is your heart? 
Where is your heart? If you are having trouble, listen to me well, I'm not going to stutter. If you are having trouble giving, you need an altar. You're not submitted to God if you cannot give. Because if God, if you say, well, God, I give you my heart. I, I give you, I, you know, I, Lord, I, I give you my time. Lord, I give you, but you can't give him this. You're not submitted. You're not crucified. So stop, stop pretending. Stop making an altar a place where you go to apologize. Sometimes God gets sick of our apologies, just like a spouse. If you have a spouse that continually wrongs, you know, continually, let's just say, let's just say the, the, the guy, he, he leaves his socks in the middle of the floor all the time. And, 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 and he does it again. I'm sorry. And then he does it again. I'm sorry. And he does it again. I'm sorry. Don't, don't look at Brother Jason so hard. I'm sorry. <laughs> at some point, at some point, your spouse is going to say, I'm sick of hearing, I'm sorry. Do something. Stop turning God's altar as a place of apology all the time. It is good to apologize, but it's more important to change. Okay, now is the time for confession. So every <laughs> If I can get the ushers to come. <laughs> I'm only joking. Giving is not about the church. It is not about New Covenant Pentecostal Church. This is his church. He has proven time after time to this church, not just, I know he's proven it to other churches, but I'm just talking about this church. Since I've been pastor, he has proven time after time after time that he's going to take care of his church. He is going to provide for this church. So giving is not about this church. This church financially is doing just fine. God has blessed us tremendously, Bill. Over and over and over. Giving is about you. It's about how God has blessings in your life and whether you're going to have a blessings of God or you're going to have a devourer in your life. I've seen it in my own life. I, can, I know we're, 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 we're over. But I've seen it time and time in my own life. In the past, with me and Sister Amy, when we were younger, we were not faithful givers. We struggled in, faith, in being faithful. We gave. But it, we might miss here, do that, you know, Bill would come up or something. But you know what? About 15 years ago, my dad preached a message similar to this right here. And God spoke to me and said, if you'll give, I'll supply. And I told Sister Amy, we're going to give a tenth. Whether tenth is, whether that is a heaven or hell issue or whether it's a law, you know what? For me, you know what a tenth is? It's a good starting point. It has got to be the floor, not the ceiling. Exactly. Get a hold of that. It's got to be the floor. The tenth part is, is the least. It's the beginning. It's the beginning. It's, it's the, the beginning. floor, not the ceiling. But when God spoke to me in the last 15 years, me and said, God has supplied over and over. We have not... Before that, 15 years ago, we struggled continually over and over. And since that time, God has done nothing but blessed and blessed and blessed and blessed. And he's made a way. Have we had financial problems? Absolutely, we've had struggles. But every single time, my God has blessed us over and over ever since we have been faithful givers to the house of God. If you will be a faithful giver, you will see the devourer leave your home and you will see the blessings of God rain in. How many believers do I have here right hey. now? When we were talking about him teaching on this, uh, it, the conversation did not come up because of church needs. It, it has nothing to do with the church needing money. We're, we're not up here trying to get you money. That's, that's why we're not taking up an offering. We don't have an offering plan. 
Nothing like that. It's not about church needs. We just consistently see the devour in this building. Right. Over and over and over in people's lives. Right. I've seen the devour Amen. over and over and over. And I know that there's a way out of that. Yes. This is the way out of that. Through yes. giving unto Jesus Christ. He, I've never seen the righteous forsaken. I've never seen his seed begging bread. And he will supply your needs. Right. Yes. Amen? Amen. Amen. I hope the young people, we especially... Uh, we're focusing on our young people today. I know Brother Tim mentioned them several times. Uh, we need our children because this is the, these are the, the church of tomorrow. Right. Amen. If they're not givers, we're right. Right? right. The church is in trouble. Right. Yeah. Amen. We, we've got to have our young people understanding the concept of blessings unto God through giving. Amen. Yeah. How many enjoy being in the house of God today? Yeah. Thank you. This is a common question I've, I've had over and over again. Do I give before taxes, tithe, pre-tax, or after tax? I have a standard answer for that. What kind of blessing do you want? You want a pre-tax blessing or a post-tax blessing? I got. I need all I can get. <laughs> yeah, you'll have to make that determination on yourself. But that's a good. That's a good. Good idea. I, I, I personally. Uh, give on, on my on my increased total. Amen. So God bless you. Don't forget Wednesday night Bible study. We're going to have a great time around here Wednesday evening uh, for Bible study. All the announcements next Saturday. Uh, the, uh, the the, the uh, 10 a.m. They're going Sunday school is going to Fun Family Fun Center. The note burning next Sunday. Uh, church cleaning on the 24th. We're going to do some yard work and all kind of things. Maybe do some repairs. We, I know we've got, I need to talk to some men. Uh, we've got uh, some sinks back here that is not working right. Uh, they're stopped up. We need to get cleaned out. And uh, they're, I think the uh, kitchen faucet, one of the drains keeps popping down. And, and we need to remember to get that. So if some men will come find me and we'll talk about that. And then um, Brother Chester uh, on the 25th, Easter egg hunt on the 31st, youth movie night. Resurrection Sunday, we're going to have a great time Easter. Invite somebody to the house of God with you. Bring somebody with you uh, to, to the house of God uh, next Sunday during this revival and on Easter Sunday as well. God bless you. You're dismissed in Jesus' name.